with my colleague Salama Mariati, president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Our next panel is about a subject that's very important to our community, to our country, and the world, which is human rights abroad and the role of the U.S. policy in advancing it. What are the challenges and opportunities facing our government as we seek to tackle some truly difficult issues affecting the world? With us is Peter Beinart, who teaches national reporting and opinion writing at Newmark J, J School and political science at the Cunny Graduate Center. He's also the editor of, at large at Jewish Current. He also has his own newsletter on Substack called the Beinart Notebook. Uh, we are so thrilled to have him given the national platform that he has on important issues, particularly the Arab-Israeli conflict, the question of Palestinian rights, and U.S.-Israeli relations, among many other topics. But this is traditionally, and every poll backs it up, a key issue of the Muslim community. Uh, with us also is a, a great friend of mine and, and, a, and an incredible intellectual, is Samar Ali. Samar Ali uh, is at Vanderbilt's political science and law faculty member and is a research professor with over 14 years of experience in international relations and legal practice. She's also the CEO of Millions of Conversations, which is a nonprofit dedicated to uniting Americans in these polarizing times around common values or shared futures by fostering dialogue among those who hold different views. Imagine that. And I know that she's a proud Palestinian Syrian American with an incredible personal story so we're really thrilled to have you both here for this important conversation. And I, I wanted to just kick us off here, if, if you don't mind, uh, and I'll start with you, Peter. You know, we're living in these polarizing times and the United States is facing some very difficult issues abroad. Vladimir Putin and Russia invaded Ukraine. And we have one of the biggest security challenges perhaps facing Europe uh, since the end of World War II. For those of us who are advocating for human rights abroad and for a principled, values-driven U.S. policy, how should our government approach these trade-offs in terms of leaning in in support of Arab democracy, leaning in in support of Palestinian rights, leaning in in terms of uh, engaging whether it's the Indian government or the Chinese government on their own uh, human rights violations, just in terms of the macro picture what, what should be the guiding principles of how we approach these difficult, challenging, at time contradictory issues? I guess one principle that comes to mind for me is the, is the Hippocratic oath, do no harm, right? It seems to me that um, the first thing that we should look at is America's direct role in providing arms and support mm -hmm. to regimes that then use that arm, those arms and support to oppress people, right? There are horrific, horrific things that are done by America's adversaries that we should publicly oppose, denounce, even impose sanctions on. Um, but our resources there are limited. Uh, in, um, in, 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 in China, in Russia, the terrible human rights abuses that are taking place are not being done with American money or American provided weapons. So our, our resources are more limited. I think the, 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 the lower hanging fruit, honestly, is there are the places where there are human rights abuses that are being perpetrated that we are funding through our own taxpayer dollars. So I think that will be one principle. A second principle, I think, is that interests and democratic ideals, it seems to me, come closer together when one thinks in the longer term, and they are more sharply at odds in the shorter term. And I understand why presidents, administrations often want to have to think in the longer term. Oh, we need the Saudi oil now because the price of oil is very high. But oftentimes that can be more self-defeating over the longer term. And so when I think about American policy in the Middle East today, right, where what we're doing is pushing for a tighter alliance between uh, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, to, to counter Iran, we are actually promoting authoritarianism in all of those different countries, right? One of the, we, what we're doing is we're selling arms to authoritarian regimes in the Middle East. We're helping facilitate Israel, providing surveillance technology to help these dictatorships better spy on their own dissidents. And we're giving Israel a path as Israel further entrenches its fundamentally undemocratic and illiberal 
the control of Palestinian territory, right? And see, it seems to me in the short term, this is good. This can help us get more oil and we can be stronger against Iran. But over the longer term, what impact is that going to have on the relationship between the United States and the populations in these territories, whether it's Palestinians who are suffering under Israeli uh, military occupation, uh, uh, or whether it's Saudis or Emiratis or Bahrainis who are suffering under those tyrannical regimes. So it seems to me one of the things that we need to think about is whether we're hurting our interests in the long term in an effort to support, help them in the short term. We're going to be hearing later on from Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer about these challenges and, 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 and these principles. Salam, you know, you and I have spoken quite a bit about what uh, this policy should look like in the region, and I'm always, you know, appreciative of your wise perspective on it. I wonder if you can join us in this conversation and, and ask Peter um, about some of what we're discussing. Well, yeah, I think, uh, you know, those of us in the human rights sector, we, we always want to advance it, um, human rights as an agenda in US policy, but there are US interests and some of them are very short uh, sighted, the ones you outlined before. So how do we continue engaging? Because a lot of the comments I get from the community is, you know, politics is a dirty business, don't even get involved in it. So they, they remain isolated. And so we, we don't have the numbers um, to, to really, work in, in creating that uh, momentum. So what do you say to our communities and our meaning, uh, both of our communities, to continue working for a human rights agenda uh, and, and addressing the realities of US interests? Well, I think that one of the blessings um, uh, of living in the United States is that as though we have a very, very deeply flawed, and I would say even imperiled democracy, we still do have institutions that can be responsive to public opinion when people really uh, um, when people really mobilize. I mean, the anti-apartheid movement, for instance. The United States government had no interest in ending its long-standing alliance with South Africa. Um, the United States considered the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela a terrorist organization. It only looked at that issue through a one-dimensional prism. South Africa is on our side in the Cold War, therefore they serve our interests. But it was a mass, it was moral leadership from Black South Africans combined with a massive movement of Americans across a variety of different communities that actually dramatically changed the politics over the course, particularly of the 1980s. And so, excuse me, Jews and Muslims, both of whom many of us in our own family histories have the experience of living under oppressive regimes, should recognize how incredibly valuable it is to live in a country where actually our voices can be expressed. And also that by expressing those voices, we actually strengthen those democratic institutions and make them more resilient so they can better sustain the threats that they're, fa being, they're facing from within. Here, here. So you're, 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 mm -hmm. you're nodding your head and, and I wanna invite you to co comment on, on what you're hearing, but also, you know, those of us who genuinely, well, we think of ourselves as genuinely caring about human rights. We try. Um, and you're looking around in the world and it seems to be in trouble in many places. Um, how do we maintain attention on these issues and mobilize people for action despite what's in front of us, which is, hey, gas prices, the economy, inflation, uh, in, some kind, in some cases, even unsavory alliances that seem to be needed in this moment in time. Um, so I, I, I wanna hear your Yeah, thoughts. well, I think Peter actually just outlined that. I'm gonna answer that, but I first wanna say thank you and say more. they come to everybody. Um, it's oh, truly an you. honor to be here with you in this hybrid event. I wish I was there in person. Um, and it's so good, it's so good to see friends here. Um, and uh, so thank you for inviting me. I'm very proud to be with you um, here today. Um, and I would say, you know, I really think well, we have to go back to basics. And Peter was talking about this as well. Who have you ever met that says, I want to live in an, under an oppressive regime of where my rights are taken away from me, of where I don't have freedom, of where I'm living um, under a corrupt system that um, steals from me and, is, and then is dishonest, and that's the way I want to live. Have, have you ever heard that? Have you ever, have you ever met anybody that said that to you, that that's what they want? Um, so I think that what we need to do in terms of the narrative are talk about values and principles that people can relate to across the world um, and show and prove that they work. And this gets to Peter's point as, with regards to consistency, which I'm going to talk about. I just want to talk about that and add on to some of his points in a moment. 
But just to boil it down to these simple points, we're talking about freedom and justice. And that includes, and I just wanna make sure you can hear me because you're frozen. Can I do a check? Check. Okay, great, thank you. I just wanna say, kind of going back to freedom and justice. These are key values and points. And that includes freedom from corruption. We are seeing a global corruption problem right now. Um, and also fairness and honesty. And, and talking about those values and those principles and hard work that relates to everybody, every human being. And that's when we talk about human rights, one of the first, the key end of that first word, which is human, human rights. And, and that brings me to this point of you simply cannot have national security without human rights. And I realized this more than ever when I worked in the White House with John Finer. This became so clear to me. We mustn't politicize or weaponize our national security apparatus and say that one comes before the other. No, they need each other. They're in sync with each other. And that includes the surveillance of activists, by the way. We have to stand up and we have to say no to that because that is in violation of human rights. And that violation leads to an insecure um, security system. And so that goes about back to values-based policies that are domestic and foreign. Both domestic and foreign policies in the United States must be rooted in our values that are in alignment with our democratic principles. That's what being a democracy means. If we're not doing that, we're something else. We're not a democracy. So if we're not doing that, what are we? What are we enabling? And the problems never stay outside of our borders. We need consistency across the board and a deep commitment to protection of human rights. And coming back to consistency, and I promise I'll be brief on this, we need consistency and the deep commitment to the protection of human rights defenders. And it, allow, and it follows to all those who oppose the authoritarian regimes that destroy human rights and that apply and that can particularly right now applies to the war against Russia. And yes, we won't always get this right, as many make this point. Inconsistency and even hypocrisy at moments are bound to happen when humans are involved. But we must admit this when it happens, not be in denial or cover it up. And also the degrees in which this happens along with how often must be taken into account. We must be honest with ourselves when it seems that it has effectively become our policy, we have ultimately lost our way. And the cost of that is deadly and generational. And I don't need to continue to give too many more examples of this other than to say, look at what happened in the Iraq war, the beginning of this century, and the torture memos, and the drone strikes, and the Patriot Act, and the lack of accountability for the killing of US journalists and other journalists like Khashoggi and Shireen. And I think that one of the questions we need to be asking ourselves is if, we have effectively been living under the Kissinger doctrine for US foreign policy for the past half century. And if so, does it work for us as a nation and a democracy moving forward? And of course we should discuss, has it ever worked for us? One of the things we were talking about before the panel is if, when we are engaging US officials, like we're gonna be engaging in a little while, uh, somebody from the administration and the National Security Council, they, they, they uh, sometimes comment on how personally they're, um, they're really uh, challenged in terms of addressing these uh, the human suffering in the region um, and feeling they can't do anything about it. Um, so how how do you how do you deal with that? You know, in, in engaging U.S. officials. You know, demanding that they do what's morally uh, upright, uh, but at the same time dealing with what I what we see is a national security apparatus that has prevented uh, us from really moving forward on a human rights agenda. So there's a there's a story that I I, I sometimes think about that supposedly happened in 2008 when um, Barack Obama was asked a question at an event. He was a can he was a candidate, and someone from the audience who was Jewish said to him, you know. Uh, um, we, I, I'm a Jew, and I, I really oppose American policy towards Israel because I think the United States is subsidizing uh, oppression of Palestinians, and I, I want you to change that policy. And um, Obama then quoted a conversation that Franklin Roosevelt had had 
uh, with, with the famous uh, Black labor leader, A. Philip Randolph, when Al A. Philip Randolph said he wanted Franklin Roosevelt to desegregate the U.S. government. And Roosevelt said something along the lines of, put 10,000 people on the White House lawn and make me do it, which was mm -hmm. essentially, this. I think what Obama was thinking is, I would do that. I agree with you, but I'm a politician, right? Mm -hmm. And so I live within certain constraints. It is your job to change those constraints. And I have to say, one of the things that I, is for me, it feels tragic uh, as a Jew is that we in the Jewish community uh, have not been able to change the politics in our community in order to change the political incentives that even someone I think like Barack Obama, who I think more than any other president, perhaps with maybe except for Jimmy Carter, actually did have a genuine, I think, understanding and empathy for Palestinians. And he was still very, very constrained. And probably the answer is that we can't do it. Jews, we uh, progressive Jews can't do it alone. It has to be a coalition, a broad coalition, which includes Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans, Americans in general of goodwill. But politicians respond to incentive. Government officials respond to incentives. Maybe they will stick their necks out a little bit. But ultimately, we have to get them out of the box that they're in by changing the political dynamics that, we're mm -hmm. in, they're, that, that they're in. And so I think that's ultimately what the great movements in American history, whether it's the civil rights movement or the labor movement or the women's movement, anti-Vietnam, LGBT, you know, rights movement, though that's what they've ultimately done. Can I just follow up just a, a digression here? Because I wanted to ask Peter just a personal question. Uh, you're you said you're involved in the progressive mm -hmm. uh, side of, of this issue, but yet you're Orthodox Jew. Um, and I find that fascinating mm -hmm. because I think we in you know in the Muslim community, when we think about progressive mm -hmm. issues that Somehow we have to liberalize our religion mm -hmm. to be involved mm -hmm. in progressive mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is it important that we remain to our orthodoxy, if you will, mm -hmm. or um, authenticity in terms of our faiths while working on pro progressive issues? So that's complicated. So first of all, I would say I do go to an orthodox synagogue. I think that I'm going to put what it means to be orthodox is a theolo set of theological questions that I'm going to put aside for the for the time being. Um, I also don't want to suggest that that being an Orthodox Jew is the only way of being an authentic Jew. I think uh, many different people in our community, as I imagine among Muslims in every community, have different authentic ways of relating to one's own tradition. I would say that um, um, the I think that the value to me of engaging deeply and seriously with Jewish texts um, is that they can offer um, answers about the way one lives, and they also offer a competing perspective that takes one out sometimes of the dominant culture that exists in the United States in 2022, which has some wonderful features in some of it, but sometimes it's very valuable to hear a dissenting voice and also to be able to feel connected to a, a long tradition that connects you to things that are not just of the here and now. I also think it's very, very valuable to have a religious tradition that impose certain restraints. Um, mm -hmm. We, in some ways, live in a society where, you know, a lot of restraints have been exploded. In some ways, that's really good. But I actually also think the discipline of certain restraints, whether it's, it's prayer or certain kind of restrictions on how one lives one's life, having a day of rest is, is profoundly important. I do think it's important to acknowledge that as I read Jewish texts, and I, I can't speak for, for Muslim texts, or, but there are radically different voices in those texts. There are voices that speak in the most profound terms about human dignity. And there are also voices that speak in very chauvinistic and frankly, even bigoted and even very violent terms. So I would not say that I speak, that, that my progressive ideals, the, the centrality of the idea of human dignity is the only or authentic voice in Judaism. It's the voice in Judaism that speaks to me, the one that I want to magnify, and the one that I try to rem remind others in my community when is sometimes lost, right? That, that the first people created, according to Torah, are not Jews. Right, Adam, Eve, Noah, according to our tradition, those are not Jews. These are universal human beings. And the fact that they precede the story of the Jewish people tells us something very profound in our tradition. Yeah, and I didn't mean to say yeah. that. No, no, no. It's okay. the, the one group is only uh, yeah. authentic. But, no, I know you didn't. I, but the issue of authenticity yeah. uh, coming towards the issue of Palestine and Israel is important for both of our communities. Yes, know? yes, right? yes. And I think one of the things that, I mean, I want to go too long. I think one of the things that at its best, Jew, American Jews have been able to show, uh, including Orthodox Jews, that one can live a very rigorously religious life according to a quite rigorous religious law and also participate fully, you know, uh, and I think Joe Lieberman represented this. I don't uh, like his politics on Israel-Palestine at all, but he was, a, I think, a beautiful model of how someone can live that life. And it seems to me that, especially for people who have 
legally driven religious traditions, it's really, really important to send the message that those two things are possible. Yeah. And, and as you said, and I think the same thing in Islamic tradition, before religion was revealed to us, human dignity was the most important right. value that God was delivering uh, to our messengers, right. whether it's Adam and Eve or right. Noah and right. so on and so forth. So I think there, that commonality is important. Anyway, I'm off my religion. <laughs> I just wanted to get it off my chest. I wanted to hear what, what Peter had to say. I, said, no, I think it's fascinating. So back to you, Wow. So so drilling down a little bit, uh, <laughs> Samar, you know, as someone with uh, fam familial as well as um, uh, professional connections to both Syria and Palestine, uh, how and where does the struggle for Palestinian and Syrian liberation intersect? Are there mutually exclusive aspects to these struggles? Hmm. More specifically, there's a perception that opposing the brutality of Assad may somehow undermine Palestinian rights. Is this true? Why and how did this perception emerge? And how can we overcome it? Well, I think we know how it emerged. So I'm, I mean, if we have more time, I can get into that. So I, I think we, I think most people know how it emerged and why it emerged. If you're, if you're um, broadly familiar with Middle East history and politics of the 20th century, but what I would say is that I think that that is a very dangerous and short-term view to think that they're at odds with each other. They are not at odds with each other. And I think you've all three already um, spoken about why they're not at odds with each other. And that goes back to the bottom line. And that is, it comes down to what are people, individuals, communities um, asking for? They're asking for human rights. It goes back to dignity, which our, you've talked about the importance of, um, of religious teachings. And I know that it's an all Abrahamic faith is about dignity. Um, it's about freedom. It's about peace. And I should say peace, positive peace, not negative peace which is faux peace, real positive peace. And I'm speaking to you today from Nashville, Tennessee. So in addition to being Palestinian, Syrian, and Muslim American, I'm also a Southerner. And I grew up in a post-Confederate town called Waverly, Tennessee. And I'll tell you, and it was in, and for way too, for, for um, too many decades, too many seconds, um, it was under Jim, it lived under Jim Crow law. And we learned, as we've seen um, in Brown versus Board of, Educa of Education in this country, separate can never mean equal. And equal is at the heart of what we're talking about when we talk about freedom, when we talk about justice, when we talk about fairness, when we talk about the potential to live life in the ways that we dream about for ourselves and for our children. And I, and having worked as a mediator um, and where I first met you uh, on the Syrian conflict and meeting everyday Syrians going through the most painful civil war, where people were trying to figure out is how do we find a way forward where we can be quote unquote normal? And how was that normal defined? What did that mean? And anytime it meant, how can I enjoy my life and be free of this strife and this pain and this injustice of, of where I can feel equal in my home country and, and not oppressed, going back to Peter's point about oppression. And the same thing with regards to Palestinians too, both Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza and um, inside Israel, um, inside, inside 48, inside the boundaries of 4019, um, And people are saying, how, how can I have the same chance at life as my neighbor has? And so everybody here that we're talking about and with regards to everyday Palestinians, everyday Syrians are asking for the same thing. And that gets to that narrative and to the piece about civil society and the role of civil society too. And which President Obama and Peter had a similar conversation directly with President Obama, where he said exactly what you just said, exactly that. He said, there's only so far I can go as a politician. And I'll just say this, there's a great line, if you've seen the movie Selma, um, where there's a, um, in, the, in the Oval Office between Lyndon B. Johnson and Martin Luther King, uh, where M L Lyndon B. Johnson says to MLK, I need you to do your job. I need more protesters. Bring me more protesters. The more you put pressure on me, the more I will be able to do. You do your job, I'll do mine. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, Summer, we have a question from our viewing audience. 
Uh, the question is, I'm an international human rights lawyer. Do you think the average American still struggles with understanding human rights? I find that civil rights and constitutional rights are more widely understood than human rights in the USA. In interested to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. This gets back to what was first question to me, and that's on narrative. Narrative matters um, more than it, nor, narrative matters for us more than ever right now. Um, and we have to figure out how to communicate in a complex um, environment. What I mean by complex is hybrid, online, and offline. Um, and different different languages, like different words are being used to describe the same thing. So we need to figure out how to speak to everyday Americans in a way that's consistent with values and principles that we all share. So how did human rights connect to the Bill of Rights, for example? These are, the, that's the getting back to the constitution. Um, and so, yes, I mean, so oftentimes, for example, I will say, which is, happens to be the truth, I work at the intersection of human rights, national security and economic development. Many times people will scratch their heads when I say that. Um, and then I will go on to explain what that means exactly and where you can't have national security without human rights. And we can't talk about these things in a vacuum. People wanna feel safe. I just came from this panel, thank you all for accommodating me, but where we were talking about um, public safety and gun violence in America. We can't talk about gun violence without talking about public safety. We need to be able to talk about safety. What is national security about? It's also about making people feel safe. How do you make people feel safe in part that relates to respecting their human rights? And then um, I want to ask both of you, how, how do we navigate this very difficult terrain politically, you know, when those of us who are on the pro-Palestinian side are being accused of anti-Semitism? You know, there's several issues involving the ADL coming out uh, and equating anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. Uh, even singling out some of our organizations, yet we're supposed to be working together uh, in dealing with the security threat to our houses of worship and our communities, uh, and so on and so forth. How do we navigate uh, that issue? I mean, do we even do we agree with this equation? Is anti-Zionism as an ideology that may, I mean, clearly has impacted adversely the indigenous Palestinian populations, equating it distinctively and always with anti-Semitism? Mm -hmm. is, is that the right approach? And if not, what's a better way to go about it? I would say that when one talks about Israel-Palestine, one has to always keep in mind a conversation, hold a conversation about anti-Semitism in, in one hand and a conversation about anti-Palestinian bigotry in the other, right? Mm -hmm. If one doesn't even acknowledge that there is such a thing as anti-Palestinian bigotry, we don't even really have this term anti-Palestinianism, then what essentially one does is one uh, suggests that Palestinian rights and dignity don't really matter, right? I mean, in the West Bank, Palestinians and, and, and Israeli Jews live under a completely different legal system where Jews have full freedom of movement, due process, citizenship, the right to vote. Palestinians have none of those things. This is a form of, and it's actually just being renewed. There was a vote yesterday in the Israeli Knesset to renew it again, right? This is a profound form of institutionalized bigotry, at least as profound as Jim Crow in the South in the United States, right? So this is anti-Palestinian bigotry. So if we're gonna be, if we're gonna, we, if we wanna hold people to a high standard of, of not being anti-Semitic, because of course we should, we should hold them to an equally high standard of not being anti-Palestinian bigots. And, and the reason it's important to hold these things together, right, is that if a Palestinian is anti-Zionist, right, which is not very surprising if you are a Palestinian, right? Even if you are a Jew who believes that Zionism was a national liberation movement that was a blessing for the Jewish people because it created a state that would protect Jews in the wake of the Holocaust. You can still understand, very understandably, that, the, that for Palestinians, the impact of this movement to create a state that would privilege Jews over them led to the expulsion of half of the Palestinian population in 1948, led to Palestinian citizens living under military law until 1966, and now living, has Palestinians living under blockade and under Israeli military law. Why should Palestinians be Zionists, right? <laughs> so then the question is, why are what is their what what do Palestinians want? If Palestinians are anti-Zionist because they want Jews exterminated or subjugated, then they may very well be anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic. I think Hamas's initial charter in 1988 was an anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic document. On the other hand, if Palestinians are anti-Zionist because they say we want to live alongside you with equality under the law, 
how can that possibly be bigotry? I mean, it's an Orwellian statement to say that it is an act of bigotry to say you want equality under the law, you want everyone to be treated equally. Mm -hmm. So that's the important question. And similarly, if someone is a Zionist, someone supports a Jewish state, we also should ask them, do you believe that Palestinians deserve to be treated equally? Do you believe it's okay to discriminate against Palestinians? Those people should also be asked to ask that, ask that question. And right now, we essentially, that question is almost virtually not asked at all in Washington. Can you tell us about the conference you're attending in Germany? Yeah, I don't want to go into too long, but you know, Germany is a place where perhaps for obvious historical reasons, speaking about Palestinian rights and, and criticism Extremely because of the way in which anti-Semitism is used in Germany are called hijacking. We that to 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 misuse Semitism, um, given the history of it, right? This term has immense power. It should have power. Because of what has been done to our people. And therefore, we should speak about it reverently, um, not to be fighting anti Semitism as part of all people. Because what's wrong about anti Semitism fundamentally is not, the, is not that bigotry was done to Jews, but that bigotry was done to any people. And so, any effort that ends up using anti Semitism to perpetuate bigotry against any other people, it seems to me, is fundamentally in contradiction to the tradition that we should be supporting. Summer, did you want to respond to the initial question as well? Um, sure, and I, I was cutting out the second half was just cutting out just a little bit, but I got I think I got enough. And I, I would just say, read what Herzl wrote. I think when I speak to people um, who want to comment on this, oftentimes I'll ask them, "Did you read what Herzl wrote in the late 1800s when there was the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe and his vision for Zionism?" And actually, in his writings, he talked about their importance for equality, and he did not talk about separate ever being equal. He never, he never referred to that doctrine, which was quite active at the time in the United States and was out there as a form. And so when people even talk about Zionism, I want to understand how they're defining it. Um, and I would also go back to um, say, saying that uh, everyone should be anti, everybody should be fighting against anti-Semitism. And, and I know there are a lot of movements around the world and here um, that are doing that. And we should not ever conflate the two. It's very dangerous to conflate the two um, for, for many reasons because anti-Semitism is real. And we do have to come together and focus our resources on defeating anti-Semitism. And, and if we're declaring anti-Zionism as equal to anti-Semitism, this is just wrong and we have to push back on it. It paints large swaths of political opinions on political issues as blanket hatred of a people based on their religion, which is undeniably wrong. And this goes back to my other point with, um, I, think, I think that what I would actually talk about is what I think we're having, and I'm hearing more and more the conversation around in Washington being is around what I call neo-Zionism. As I don't think that this practice of what people are referring to as Zionism right now is what Herzl ever wrote about and envisioned um, when, he, when he wrote the first book on Zionism, on modern day Zionism. Uh, says, I have Jewish friends who feel they cannot publicly protest Israeli policy because they will be blacklisted and not allowed to visit relatives in Israel. American Palestinians say they are marked as anti-Semitic here in the US and it affects their jobs, their political careers or any kind of political ambition for that matter. Does this not prevent protests in the US which we need to push for change? Back to your, your point that we need to pressure the uh, public officials to make them uh, act yet there, there's always this threat um, uh, under people that want uh, to create that kind of change. It's, um, it's it, it, it makes me both, it's, for me, it's both tragic and infuriating to see how many people of goodwill, Palestinians above all, but others as well, 
feel so afraid of actually just trying to apply their own basic values, the same values they would have for the United States or for any other country, which is the belief in equality under the law, and, and feel inhibited by speaking out about that because they feel that members, that there's some in my community who may, who, who may, um, you know, may call them anti-Semitic. Um, and it seems to me part of the reason that I write about these things myself is as a Jew is because I feel like I have in some small way, some responsibility to try to make it easier for those people, people of goodwill, if they really believe in equality under the law, to not be have to be ashamed or afraid of actually saying that that's what they believe in. Um, and um, I think the, you know, the 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 challenge, um, the the challenge for 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 people who support Palestinian rights, I think in in, in particular, is to try to create more opportunities for people to humanize Palestinians who've been so deeply, deeply dehumanized, so deeply dehumanized in the discourse that I think often people don't even realize how deep the dehumanization goes. And that's why I think it's so important to say in specific, it's so important that Rashida Tlaib be reelected. Um, uh, Rashida Tlaib has been, you know, I think in a singular way, someone who's been able to put a human face on the Palestinian experience at the, in, in Congress in a way that nobody else has done. And it worries me a great deal that there's going to be a huge effort to defeat her, um, to try to silence the one person who can speak from that intimate personal experience about what it means to be a Palestinian. And that's why I desperate, deeply, deeply hope that American Jews of goodwill who believe in equality will support her and, and, and try to kind of show that this is not... Um, uh, ultimately, it's not in the best interest, it seems to me, of Israeli Jews or Jews at all to, to continue a process of dehumanization. A process of dehumanization ultimately only produces hatred and violence, it seems to me, that hurts everybody. That, that, yeah, that, I just wanted to, no, I just wanted to add one thing. Can I add one thing? Yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say about, and I think there's a word here to be used, and that's to criminalization of the Palestinian identity. And I think that we have to be very careful not to criminalize an identity. And that's what many Palestinians feel, um, and uh, myself at times included. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you that um, um, people who have worked with me have told me that people have whispered to them, be careful about working with her. She's not a nice person, except, well, some people will say that. But, and they say, but, <laughs> they say, but she's Palestinian, she can't help it. She, you know, we know she was born that way, but if you, have, if you have interest in having a political career, even being associated with working with a Palestinian American could be career suicide for you. Um, and that was made more than once. And so it's just even we have to be able to have a conversation as human beings around the subject and it's extremely painful. Um, and I'll tell you this too, when I was elected student body president at Vanderbilt University, um, uh, when I was 20 years old, um, people said, people were, because some people were even saying, and somebody ran a, a newspaper ad about this that just simply assumed and stated because she's Palestinian, she's anti-Semitic. That is, not only ridiculous, that's painful, especially when it's an assault on your value system. I wanted to connect the last panel with this panel in terms of counterterrorism policy and national security. You know, we complain about what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs. We complain about what's happening now to Indian Muslims uh, by the Hindutva, Hindutva movement uh, and so on and so forth. Yet they are using U.S. counterterrorism, the U.S. counterterrorism playbook. You identify a group uh, as a group of terrorists, you suspend international law and uh, civil rights law, um, and you can do what you want to do with them. And to a large extent, that's what's been done to the Palestinians. They're violent, they're extremists, and, and therefore they, they don't deserve uh, human rights uh, to begin with. Um, how, how do we address counterterrorism policy that is so slanted um, in terms of you know, dealing with only one region and, and not applying it uh, to ourselves um, in terms of having uh, a consistent policy on human rights? I mean, I think the truth is that the term terrorism itself is, is for so many people in the United States, particularly after 9-11, so deeply saturated with religious associations um, that it's very, very difficult to use the term at all, I think, in an objective and neutral way. Generally, when people ask, you know, uh, if you ask people, and, and I think it's better not to use the term at all, frankly. If, you, if someone is using violence against civilians, which I believe is always wrong, say they're using violence against civilians, if using violence 
for a political aim say that, right? It seems to me that's a much more neutral way of, of, of talking about it. I guess the only other point I would make is one of the things that I think we've seen in American history that is very, very dangerous is that when America uh, creates a geopolitical conflict with a certain nation or a certain nations that have particular religious or racial or ethnic categories, um, the people in the United States who get associated with that foreign adversary often get crushed. You can go back to to German Americans during World War One, to the Japanese. Um, uh, I don't need to tell this audience about you know about how much Muslim Americans have suffered from this. And I I think that it is very very important that we that as we move towards a kind of a new Cold War with China. And obviously China does some horrific things, starting with with what it's doing in Xinjiang and continuing with Hong Kong and many many other things. It's a brutally repressive government. We should talk about that. But when you create a sense of paranoia, the Chinese are about to take over. They're, they're, they're about to destroy us. This kind of language we now see more and more. It is not a coincidence that now we're seeing a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes all over the United States. And I think we have to be very, very careful about that. I think that we saw after 9-11 the way in which American foreign policy was used to victimize a group of people in the United States. And I worry that we could be on the verge of another cycle like that uh, uh, with Chinese and, and other Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. Summer, you have the last word. Oh, no, I just was gonna say, I absolutely share that concern and we're seeing that um, violence in the name of, I think that's exactly the language that we should use. Um, and it comes back to just to hone in on the point that I've been making consistently and going back to that point about consistency um, is it comes back to what are, our, what are our values? What are our principles as a democracy? We're feeling tensions right now between democracy and authoritarianism. We're on the side of democracy for a reason, not just because we were born into it. Some of us were born into it, some of us sought it. But here we are, and we need to not assume that people who live in places of authoritarianism agree with that, but they're looking to us to demonstrate solutions that work, that are consistent, that are, that are rooted in values and principles. We have to, back to somebody's question, we have to model solutions at home that are consistent with these values and principles that can be replicated the world over. There is, there to, because of the fourth industrial revolution that we're currently living in right now, in this state, online, offline, the role of technology, things have, and, and just how the workforce has shifted and changed. Uh, so we have all these workforce development movements happening around the United States right now. People, the, the world is in flux. People are looking for solutions and they want to say, who, which, which system makes sense? And one thing that turns, the fastest thing that will turn people off is going to be hypocrisy. It's going to be systematic inconsistencies. And so we have to be truthful and our, we can't only use words, our actions matter, our actions count. And people will respect us so much more when we admit our mistakes because you can do that in a democracy. And that's also what the First Amendment is for too, to allow us the freedom to talk about these things and to do this. And, and that gives people hope. So I think I'll just say this last point to tie into Peter's point just a minute ago as well. As we see this, we're all talking about US and China. We're all talking about US and Russia right now. It's everywhere. And, and we, as we talk about the rise of China this century, people are debating, is this China's century? Is it the US and China's century? Whose century is it? I think we have to be very careful in the rhetoric that we use. Words matter. We want to be thoughtful in how we talk about the tensions between the US and China. And we wanna learn from our past, especially from the past 20 years during the war on terror. What language was not helpful? What language drove us more apart, intensified the polarization in our country? What lessons have we learned? What does our way forward look like? And how can that way forward be anchored in our values and principles as a democracy? Show, don't tell. That's, that's really well said. And I, I really wanna thank you, Samara and Peter for, for thought provoking and, and just such a uh, well-grounded uh, yet realistic conversation about this subject. Very so rich. thank you so much for yes. joining us. Yep. And we would love to have you back at a, at a, at a future convening. Thank you so we'll much. meet you in New York. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Thank you. So for our audience, we're going to now get started very quickly with our next panel in exactly 60 seconds with Deputy National Security Advisor 
job finder. Hello, everyone, and we're back. I'm Wael Zayat, CEO of Engage with Salam al Mariati, President of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We are so thrilled to uh, join, uh, be joined by uh, distinguished Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer. Uh, John Finer is a deeply experienced journalist as well as U.S. diplomat. He currently serves as a Deputy National Security Advisor. He had previously served as a Chief of Staff of former Secretary of State John Kerry. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with John in the Obama administration, where we really tried to tackle some of the most difficult issues facing our country, particularly in the Arab and the, and the Muslim world. John, just want to make, do a cons check to make sure you're hearing us and you're good to go. I hear you very well. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we can. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, John, and, and, and we know that you're uh, you know, dealing with a lot of issues uh, that the administration and our nation is confronting, so we'll get right into it. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to say a few words, if you would like, and then we can get into a q and if, if you would like that, or we could go into the questions. It's, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Wyon. Thanks, Salam, and thanks to everybody for uh, being here. Maybe I'll just say a few things to, to sort of frame how, how we look at these issues, and then obviously happy to talk about whatever's on, on your mind. Um, I guess to start out with, uh, the Biden administration came in with one big advantage on human rights issues and one significant disadvantage. The big advantage, and I don't mean this as a political statement, is that we had pretty small shoes to fill when it came to an uh, international human rights agenda. Uh, not our predecessor's uh, strong suit, uh, certainly in our view, but the disadvantage is that fundamentally we had a big hole uh, to dig out of on this uh, set of issues and a lot of work to do uh, right off the bat. So, so what has that work looked like? First, I think the way we see it is we just had to reset the foundation of our work on this set of issues. And that meant reversing uh, policies that we strongly disagreed with, both on policy grounds and to some extent even on, on moral grounds in some cases. And these were things like uh, the travel ban uh, and a, a refugee admissions cap uh, that was just unconscionably low at a time of a global migration crisis. It meant things like rejoining uh, the Human Rights Council, which we uh, did last October, and publishing a, a racial equity EO. Just a number of steps that we took to put a foundation under our uh, human rights work and, and advocacy in, in the world and essentially re-enter the conversation. Uh, second, we had to change the tone. Uh, and I think here, you know, it'd be hard to imagine a starker difference uh, from one president uh, to another, but you have uh, President Biden talking about human rights from the very beginning as being at the center of our foreign policy. Now you can debate the degree to which uh, we have made good on that. We believe that we have. Uh, but talking about human rights in that way frames the issue uh, with a particular priority that we think was just critically important and lacking uh, in recent years. This is also part of uh, the way that the president has framed his entire worldview as being on some level a clash uh, between democracies and autocracies, uh, a frame uh, that had led us to host uh, the first democracy summit uh, last year, where we put this set of issues, uh, including human rights, uh, really front and center uh, with, with much of, of the world that cares about and values these sorts of things. Uh, it's part of why we published the first strategy on countering uh, corruption also last December, and uh, part of why we just talk about these things in a fundamentally different way. Uh, third, it can't also just be talk, uh, and we know that that is uh, very much the case. And so in, in some ways, the hardest part of the agenda is integrating human rights into all of our foreign policy work. That is what it means to put human rights front and center uh, at our agenda, of our agenda. And we do this both because it's the right thing uh, to do. I don't think anybody would dispute uh, that statement, but also because we believe fundamentally that it's in our interest uh, to do that. Uh, and we believe that countries that share our values or that are moving in the direction of, of kind of greater sharing of our values make better partners. And that those that violate our values fundamentally or are moving in the wrong uh, direction uh, just frankly, they're not going to be as good partners in addressing the big problems uh, the world faces. And so this is why we have uh, taken a number of steps that I know we'll get into in the actual conversation uh, on issues like Xinjiang, on uh, uh, Russia and, and Ukraine, 
uh, focusing on the human rights dimension of that conflict, on uh, issues like the entities listing of the NSO group and going after transnational oppression, uh, both through our regulatory system and our criminal justice system, uh, and a much longer list of, of examples that I can give you. Last point I'll make, uh, we talk often about trade-offs in this context, I suspect you'll ask me about some of these trade-offs. I'm not gonna reject totally the idea that there are trade-offs in this space. Sometimes uh, that is undeniable, and while you and I uh, wrestled with uh, some of these uh, very much so during uh, our time in, in government, your, your previous stint in government. But I also think that the way the president sees this actually is fundamentally there is not a pure trade-off between pursuing human rights objectives and pursuing other foreign policy objectives, between our interests and our values. I think what he would say if he were here is that our values are fundamentally in the interests of the United States and, and advancing those values is fundamentally in our uh, interest. Uh, we also, I think, don't agree with the critique we sometimes get and have gotten as recently as, as this week in the context of some decisions we've made uh, that engagement with difficult partners, engagement with partners who do not uh, fundamentally respect human rights to the degree we want them to, is a reward for those partners or lets them off the hook. First and foremost, it's our opportunity to actually raise these issues most directly. But second, uh, countries have an alternative to engaging with the United States, an alternative to partnering uh, with the United States. And when you talk about kind of major country alternatives, for the most part, you were talking about countries that are going to be far less respecting of and far less promoting of uh, human rights, democracy, anti-corruption, all these issues that I've just been describing, uh, countries like Russia and China. And so uh, if the United States does leave a vacuum with our engagement, other countries will fill that vacuum. We've seen them do that. We see them doing that in real time uh, today. And so that's part of why we believe broadly in engagements, you know, even with difficult countries. So I will uh, maybe stop there. And sorry for talking a bit longer than I intended. No, really appreciate it. So it's okay with you. I'll, I'll get yeah. into the first question. Go ahead. Um, no, I appreciate oh. that, uh, John. And, 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 you know, looking at what the administration is confronting right now domestically, internationally, I do not envy your job or that of your colleagues. Drilling down a little bit into specifics here. Um, we're looking at a set of countries right now that are particularly concerned, whether it is Egypt, Saudi Arabia, but also supposedly the world's largest democracy, India, where there's various degrees of, 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 of problematic behavior by the governments vis-a-vis -vis the civil rights of their citizens. India, 200 million Muslims right now, we feel, and, and many observers believe, are at the precipice of perhaps a genocide given the policies of the Modi government and the ruling party. Whether you wanna call them trade-offs or, or other, other pressing priorities, how is the administration grappling this? Let's, let's keep it on India a little bit. At a time where we're, we, we are dealing with, with a rising China, we need international support on Ukraine. Are we having these conversations with the Modi government on some of these laws that have been passed, the rhetoric that's coming out of their, their own political circles? What are they saying and what are we doing or prepared to do to, to, to support those values that, that you just said are in our national interest? Right, thanks. So I'll, I'll maybe reference uh, the countries that you just mentioned, obviously, including uh, in India in, in response. And so, look, uh, I am you know, going to be clear that India is a very close partner of the United States, uh, has been for quite some time. And actually, that's a pretty bipartisan uh, a, a relationship that's that's uh, been strengthened and advanced over a, a few decades uh, now. One of the few areas in which our, our foreign policy is not actually veered all that much uh, in different directions as we've uh, shifted from Democratic to Republican administrations. And that is a strategic uh, relationship. It is also, uh, I think we would make the case, very much based on on values, on, on the fact, uh, obviously, that India is the largest, most populous democracy in the world. That is not to say, by any stretch of the imagination, that we don't have some fundamental differences uh, on issues of, of governance uh, with India, including differences uh, that, that we raise. You know, the United States has been a global champion in promoting and defending freedom of religion uh, and freedom of belief uh, for all people. That is a vital piece of our overall efforts to advance uh, human rights. I think you all uh, know, everybody at this conference knows uh, that we have named uh, Rashad Hussein as our, our first ambassador at large, uh, first Muslim American ambassador at large uh, for international religious freedom. We're very close to Rashad here uh, at the White House, also uh, in the Obama administration. And I want to point out that on India specifically, just last week, 
uh, Secretary Blinken rolled out the latest version of the International Religious Freedom Report. And at that rollout, he said uh, both that India is home to a great diversity of faiths, which is undeniably uh, true, uh, but also that we've seen rising attacks on people and places of worship and expressed concern about that. Rashad also, in some follow-up comments, expressed concern about government officials' uh, awareness of and, and uh, failure to take action against those sorts of attacks. Uh, so this is an issue that we uh, talk about bilaterally uh, with the Indians. Uh, e even if it is not always uh, the first thing that we talk about in our public remarks about India, but it is also something that we talk about publicly when we talk about India. And the International Religious Freedom Report is a, is a good example of this. So again, this is a, a good example of where I sort of started, or where I guess I ended my opening remarks, which this is a big, complicated strategic relationship. We have security issues with the Indians. We have economic issues with the Indians. We also have human rights issues that we raise uh, with our fellow uh, democracy. And we don't shy away from doing that just because of these other uh, issues that we're trying to advance. I could do Saudi Arabia and Egypt too, but I feel like I talked for a long time on India, so I want to give you a chance to ask something else if you'd rather. I mean, since you mentioned Saudi Arabia, and, and again, the relationship is it's complicated, and it's not clear cut or simple, but you know, uh, we're hearing that the president has made a decision to, uh, to meet with MBS. Uh, candidate Biden, had a lot of choice words to say about uh, the Crown Prince uh, following the, the very gruesome uh, kidnapping and, and killing of, of uh, Jamal, Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's something that still is, is, is shocking even when we reflect upon it. What's the, what's the reason behind the, this perceived turnabout? And, and what assurances do we all have that business will not continue as usual with the Saudi government and just to kind of ignore and forget this horrific and many other episodes, even though the United States is uh, a close ally of, of the Saudi government. And it, particularly because we are, uh, what can we do to not only keep the memory, but also seek some real justice and change in behavior over the, long, over the short, or if not the long term? So I'll say a few things in response to this. First and, and, and foremost, I think all of us in, in this administration were, were shocked, were appalled, were outraged by the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. We don't shy away from that. The president was very clear about it uh, back before he, he took office, because obviously it took place in a, in a different administration. And that fundamental view has not changed, uh, uh, will not change. Second, I think you know, <laughs> you were catching me with this question at a slightly uh, awkward time because we have not announced uh, any sort of travel uh, to Saudi Arabia or any sort of meeting uh, with Mohammed bin Salman. So I won't uh, uh, take this opportunity to, to speak to a, a meeting that at this point is just notional and hypothetical and in the press, but not uh, something that we have confirmed or are ready uh, uh, to confirm. What I will say, though, is, um, you know, fundamentally, I, I think we have taken an approach to Saudi Arabia in this administration that has kept faith with uh, how the president views issues of human rights and foreign policy in the way that I described. We came to office and uh, we took a report that had begun under the previous administration, but that had not been published about what actually happened uh, in the Khashoggi killing, and we put it out publicly. Didn't have to do that. There was no requirement uh, that we do that. President made the decision to do that. We knew that would not exactly make things easier or more comfortable uh, with our, our Saudi partners. Second, uh, we put into place uh, this Khashoggi ban, visa ban essentially for people who uh, perpetrate or um, uh, uh, commit acts of transnational repression along the lines of what was perpetrated against uh, Jamal uh, Khashoggi, uh, which we think was an important step. And we've actually you know, uh, designated people under, under that ban. We put sanctions in place uh, related to the killing of, of Jamal uh, Khashoggi, which we think uh, was also quite important. And, and I would say without characterizing the relationship up till now, uh, you know, th this has certainly not been from the perspective of the Saudis, and, and they will be the first ones to tell you this, uh, exactly a, a situation of a warm embrace by our administration. We have worked with them uh, on issues of mutual interest, and we have significant issues of, of mutual interest. And, you know, while you know these uh, better than I do, uh, but they range from, from security uh, uh, issues uh, and, and to, to things like economic uh, issues and, and obviously energy is where uh, people often come back. So we have worked with the Saudis on that, but I don't think you could find a Saudi official to give you an interview who would say that uh, this has been a totally business as usual relationship uh, with the Saudis up till now, and I think that's why. Now, what have been the results of this? Because I think that's also uh, quite important 
to point out. And I'll, and I'll just mention one of them that has real human rights implications. We are now in the uh, second 60-day period of a ceasefire in the Yemen conflict, one that has gone on uh, far too long, uh, and just a horrible uh, situation uh, for the people of Yemen and really for the people of, of the region, uh, food insecurity uh, and, and death and destruction for you know years dating back to while when you served in, in government with me. Now, I'm not saying that this conflict is over or that this couldn't backslide, but we are now in a situation where for the first time, really since the beginning, we have an extended period of calm where humanitarian uh, relief supplies are getting in, where the fuel, uh, fuel and food crises are being a bit abated. And some of that, I'm not going to say all of it, but some of that relates to our ability to engage a difficult partner in spite of our differences when it's in our interest to do so, and, and that's Saudi Arabia. I have a question that may sound rudimentary, but there's some fundamentals that we have to uh, address. Uh, and I'll give you an illustration. I was at a conference in the Middle East, and they had uh, President Zelensky come and speak uh, over Zoom. And um, I was with some U.S. officials, and they were, they were quite curious that the audience wasn't that enthusiastic as uh, they had expected them to be. And I was trying to explain to them that, you know, while the U.S. is supporting the Ukraine and is against uh, invasion and, and aggression, uh, the people in the region feel that they've been victims of European invasion, you know, from 100 years ago, of colonialism, of so many wars uh, in the region. And, and what struck me, it's not about the policy issue per se, but what struck me is that I felt that the level of acumen uh, of the sentiment of the people by these U.S. officials is, is at an all-time low. In my 30 years working with the U.S. government, uh, I, I would think that the level of understanding would be increasing uh, in these past few years, but it seems that they did not get it. They, they are not connecting with the sentiment of the Muslim peoples. How can we work with you to improve, increase that level uh, of understanding so, uh, so that uh, our policies are more educated uh, from, uh, from that standpoint, so that we have uh, a, a better way of connecting with the people? So, uh, Salam, I want to make sure you guys can still hear me because I, I, you cut out at the end of your comments. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, good. All right. So, look, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that we have learned as we have gone around the world engaging on Russia and Ukraine is that uh, while it can feel sometimes uh, when we're talking to our European partners in particular, and even when we were talking to some of our uh, East Asian allies who've gotten kind of more involved and invested in the Russian-Ukraine conflict than we might have expected, uh, like we are in this community of like-minded people with a very clear kind of right and wrong and a perpetrator and a victim uh, when it comes to this conflict, that is not uh, as clear cut of view in much of the rest of the world. And by the way, I don't think that's just limited uh, to much of uh, what you guys are referred to as the Muslim world. I think that is true, you know, in many parts of our own hemisphere, uh, here in the Western Hemisphere. I think that is true in, in large uh, swaths of, of Africa as well. Uh, and we cannot take for granted uh, as much, again, as it is very clear to us that we are, and Ukraine is, on the right side of this conflict. That is exactly how the rest of the world will see it. Now, why is that? Uh, and what can we do about it? For one thing, I think Russia, and, and I think you all know this, is extremely effective at putting out its own uh, narrative, uh, what we would often consider to be disinformation. You know, for example, claiming that the food insecurity crisis or high energy crisis are actually the result of U.S. sanctions, as opposed to as a result of a conflict that has taken you know, enormous uh, food production off the market and significant energy supplies uh, off the market. Uh, and so that is an area that we need to do a better job of pushing back on and, and fighting against. But Russia is, is effective in, in that space. I think there is some inherent distrust of U.S. policy. I think that is something that we wrestle with, you know, going back quite some time. And so when the U.S. US is out at the, the head of a, a coalition making the case uh, that what we're doing is right and what others are doing is wrong, there are going to be uh, uh, views 
uh, that will sort of knee jerk react to the contrary of that. And that is going to be the case almost no matter what we're advocating for. But we need to understand that that's going to be the case and be ready uh, to take it on, take those arguments on, on, on the merits. Uh, and then I will acknowledge that I think there are some people that see the great lengths that the United States is going to to support and help Ukraine and believe that there is a degree of disparate treatment. That we have not done that same thing for other populations, and they will read into those decisions, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of, of kind of nefarious intentions for why people were not maybe helping populations that are more that are, that are more like uh, whoever the person is who's making this judgment. And I think that is something that we have to be aware of. It's something we were acutely aware of when we established uh, the program to try to help Ukrainians who had fled to, to third countries, uh, given uh, you know, some of the issues we face at our own border with migration, some of the issues that we dealt with in the aftermath of the drawdown uh, from Afghanistan on migration, where, by the way, we did bring uh, 75,000 Afghans, uh, more than 75,000 now, into the United States. But this disparate treatment, you know, going the extra mile for Ukrainians, but not for every population on Earth. And by the way, we have, I think we have very good reasons for why we have done as much as we have on Ukraine. But I think that's another piece of this uh, argument that we have to do a better job of explaining and taking into account. I have a follow-up question to that. How can we be of help? Uh, you know, when President Obama first took office, he went to speak to Muslims, except he had to go to Istanbul and Cairo to talk to Muslims, even though American Muslims are, you know, literally in his backyard from the White House. And he waited until the last six months of his eighth year uh, as president to finally meet with American Muslims. We don't want to make the same mistake uh, with this administration. And we feel that we have a lot to offer uh, in terms of uh, in, improving the understanding and engaging and raising awareness of why these issues are important, not just to the American Muslim community, but to U.S. interests uh, as a whole. How can we be of help in moving the, the dialogue and engagement forward? Uh, thank you again for that, that question. Uh, let me start by saying <laughs> I hope we don't wait uh, that long for the president to engage uh, these communities, I, although I do uh, hope, God willing, we do get eight years, uh, although you know, too, too early to tell on, on, on that. Um, I'm very grateful that you all invited me to come here and talk about these things. You know, they're not the easiest issues that we've got on our foreign policy uh, agenda, but we do think that we have, uh, if not a case that everyone will agree with, a, a case that is coherent, that is defensible, that we feel very comfortable uh, putting out publicly, describing and engaging, e even in a, in a sort of spirited debate about it. So some of this is just creating a forum like the one that you created uh, with this conference, Having people like me, although I uh, hopefully could do a bit better next time and get the president or somebody else to come in and talk to you, uh, but, but people like us who work on these issues come in and explain where we're coming from. I think that will help break down uh, some of the barriers, whatever barriers there are uh, that exist, because I think it is not lost on us that this is an incredibly important constituency for this president, uh, an incredibly important community in, in the United States, and one that has an acute and intense interest in some of the policy uh, areas that we spend the most time on and th that are the most challenging uh, for us, both to, to make good decisions, but also to explain them. Uh, so we also welcome, in that regard, really in good faith, uh, your feedback on the substance, on how we talk about these things. Uh, and it doesn't have to be in a big venue like this. Uh, you know, you know that we're also open to, to smaller uh, exchanges when things come up uh, along the way. Uh, thank you, John, so much for taking the time to join us. We literally just scratched the surface here in terms of the issues that the community prioritizes and cares about. We really uh, want to take you up on the offer in terms of having various uh, ways of engaging with the administration, uh, small groups, big groups, public, private, and, and bringing the right interlocutors, the credible interlocutors from our very diverse communities to have these conversations. So I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to join us. I want to thank our audience for their participation and their questions. We really look forward to continuing this dialogue with you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Fire. We really appreciate your participation and engagement, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you and the administration. Thank you both. Really good to be with you and uh, appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, John. I want to thank uh, Wild Zayat to uh, engage for bringing Mr. Feiner and, and many of our panelists. And also just want to end thank you too. Uh, to support the Million Muslim Vote campaign. I think there's a launch coming up Thursday. You know, we, we keep talking about these issues. And as was stated repeatedly, unless we make it into an issue and, and force our public officials to take a stand on, on them, 
It's not going to happen. If, if not us, then nobody will do it. Absolutely. Support the Million Muslim Vote campaign and I want to thank uh, all of our uh, co-sponsors for, for this wonderful inaugural conference. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we're going to have concluding remarks for this incredible conference in just a minute.